there have been various marches in the course of history. The march of soldiers to war, a wedding march, the last mile, the march of a condemned criminal to his death. We are considering the last march of our blessed Lord to Jerusalem. He was in Galilee. It was not far from the city of Jerusalem. Jericho is only about 23 miles away. But it took some time because of the preaching. And he announced to his disciples, I am going to Jerusalem to my death. Now remember that our blessed Lord is not the victim of circumstance. He is not under forces which he cannot control. First of all, he's God. Secondly, he's man. He had to be man in order to act in our name and to assume our sins. He had to be God in order to make up for them. And there are two ideas that we should keep in mind as we watch our Lord journey to Jerusalem. The first, he is the only one in this world who was ever pre-announced. No one ever knew a long period before that Buddha would be born or Socrates, or Plato, or you or me. But his birth was announced from the beginning. As a matter of fact, there were only two over 250 prophecies that were common in Jerusalem and the Holy Land in those days, where he would be born, where he would live, how he would die, the words that he would say when he would die. And that was the reason that Herod the Great decided to kill all of the male children under two years of age, because he knew that the king of the universe was coming. He was afraid of losing his tinsel crown. The Lord would have given him a golden one instead. Can you imagine anyone, for example, in Germany? killing all male children under two years of age some years ago in order to get Hitler or the Tsar of Russia, ordering the deaths of all male children under two in order to kill Stalin. They did not know they were coming, but they knew our Lord was coming because he was God who took on a human form. And not only was he pre-announced, He's the only one who ever came into this world to die. You and I came into this world to live. Death is an interruption. Death interrupted the teaching of Socrates. But our blessed Lord was bent on death. That was why he came. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no redemption of sin. Remember that. Without the shedding of blood, there is no redemption from sin. Sin is in the blood. It's in every alley and gateway of the body. It's in the blood of the degenerate, the blood of the alcoholic. And it is as if blood had to be poured out in order that sin might be done away with. And so he came to die. There's considerable pathos in the in a legend about our blessed Lord working in the carpenter shop as a young man. At the end of the day he was fatigued and the sun was out the door setting and he stretched out his arms in this fashion to relieve his fatigue, and the mother noticed on the wall behind him the shadow of the cross, which was ever in her mind. 
Now, given those facts, our Lord begins the journey to Jerusalem. We will just take out two or three events that were rather noticeable. One was there were three would-be followers who came to him and asked to be his disciples. One of them said, I will follow you. He wanted to know the security. What would he get out of it? Our blessed Lord said, The foxes have their holes. The birds of the air their nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lead his head. So he rejected that follower. The second one said, I will follow you for a time. I'll make a temporary commitment. Our blessed Lord says, no man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Never mind the furrows, plow straight ahead. And the third one said, my father is living. And then I have some emotional attachments at home. Later on I will follow. Our Lord said, let the dead bury their dead. But come, follow me. In other words, count the cost. Christianity is not easy. Then as he journeyed through that territory near the Sea of Galilee, which belonged to Herod, Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, who tried to kill him when he was a child. As he passed through that territory, some came to him and said, You had better leave here. Herod has a mind to kill you. Our Lord said, Listen. Go tell that vixen. He did not call him a fox. He called him a feminine fox. That vixen, I will work miracles and do cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I shall reach my goal. In other words, let not Herod think that he has mastery over my life. Jerusalem is not going to be cheated. Prophecy has it that I shall die in Jerusalem. And the Lord continued his journey, and the disciples dragged their feet. He had already told them several times that he was on the way to the cross. And they were reluctant to take on that life of discipline. And finally he comes to Jerusalem, or near it, and is told about the death of Lazarus. Our Lord went to the tomb of Lazarus, which was very close to Jerusalem, in Bethany. And in those days they were buried in deep caves, with a rolling stone in front of the grave. And even Martha and Mary had given up hopes. They said, Lord, he's been dead for four days. He already stinketh. And our Lord rose Lazarus from the dead. And immediately, some of those who watched that miracle 
And our Lord wept when he rose Lazarus from the dead. Why did he weep? We will see that he wept three times during his life. He wept because he was indignant at death. Where does death come from? It comes from sin. It comes from the devil. His resurrection will be the eventual cure of all death. Then he wept because he was angry at what evil had done and brought into the world. And some of those who saw the miracle sought to kill Lazarus in order to destroy the evidence. Others went into Jerusalem and informed the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of the city. And they said, the whole world is running after him. What can we do to stop him? So they gave orders. If anyone sees him, they are to report him, and he will be arrested. And Caiaphas, who was the high priest of that year, and we will see him again, said to the Sanhedrin that was rather confused about what to do, said, you know not what you are doing. You are stupid people. It is better that one man die rather than our nation should perish. In other words, if he becomes popular, everyone will accept him as their king and their leader. And the Romans may become angry with us. And if they do, then we may lose our place, our temple. So it is better to kill him rather than that all of us should perish. As a matter of fact, there was some truth in the words of Caiaphas. It was better that one man die for our sins rather than you and I, all of us to die in our sins and without redemption. So the order had gone out. If anyone sees him, arrest him. Our Lord is now in the city that he has chosen for the end of his life. But what is he? He's an outlaw. He is public enemy number one. Since this was Passover time, there were visitors from all over the world in Jerusalem. Among them were some Greeks. They came to see our Lord. They went first to Philip and said, we would see Jesus. And Philip told Andrew, probably the reason why they went to Philip and Andrew was because they came from a Greek-speaking village and therefore understood their language. We do not know whether or not the Greeks ever saw our blessed Lord, but we do know what they asked. And we know what the Lord answered. They were concerned about our Lord's death. It was very easy for any outsider in the city at that particular time to know that our blessed Lord was a hunted criminal. And the Greeks, perhaps, who had heard him before, were anxious to save him. Now, what they suggested precisely, that we do not know. But I think that what they said was, 
If you stay in Jerusalem, you are going to be slain. Why don't you go to Athens? The great center of the world's philosophy. We are representatives of the wise men. We have never killed any man of wisdom except one. And we have regretted ever since that we ever gave that hemlock juice to Socrates. So come to Athens and save your life. Perhaps that was their concrete suggestion, because what our Lord answered was from nature. He could not recite to them the prophecies about his death, because they did not have prophecies. So he gave a law from nature. He said, unless the seed falling to the ground dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it springs forth to new life. In other words, death is not as terrible as you think. Philosophy is no answer. The problems of life are only solved by the law that I am to undergo. Unless there is a Good Friday in your lives, there will never be an Easter Sunday. After meeting with the Greeks, our Lord attended a banquet in Bethany. It was a banquet given by Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, and perhaps Simon the leper, in gratitude for raising Lazarus from the dead. The twelve apostles were there. In the course of the dinner, Mary Magdalene took perhaps what was the fruit, if she be Magdalene, took perhaps what was the fruit of an evil life, namely some precious perfume, to give it to the Lord. Now, in those days, women often carried precious nard in a bottle about the neck. And if one of their beloved ones died, they would break the bottle over the corpse and then sprinkle the corpse with perfume and throw the remains of the bottle on the corpse. Mary Magdalene came to the feet of our blessed Lord, for in those days they reclined at table, and she did not do what you and I would do. She did not pour out that precious perfume, drop by drop, as if to indicate by the slowness of the giving the generosity of the gift. She broke the vessel and gave everything, for love knows no limits. And immediately the house was filled with perfume, almost as if after a death of that perfume, the breaking of the bottle, there was a resurrection. Broken things are precious. We eat broken bread because we share in the death of our Lord and his broken life. Broken flowers give perfume. Broken incense is used in adoration. A broken ship saved Paul and many other passengers on the way to Rome. And sometimes, sometimes, the only way the good Lord can get into some hearts is to break them. So the odor of the perfume filled the house, and Judas got one whiff of it. Oscar Wilde describes a cynic as one who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. And he immediately put a price on it. 300 days' wages. Now, that was very precious perfume. 
And he interrupted this beautiful scene of the woman breaking her precious bottle over the feet of our Lord by challenging the Savior. And she said, why all this waste could have been sold? given to the poor. Why all this waste? Why build beautiful cathedrals to adore the sovereign Lord of the universe? Why all this waste? Why should young men and women consecrate themselves wholly to the service of the Lord. Why all this waste? Why should beauty be dedicated to him, not be profaned in the world? Why all this waste? And he who said that was at that time stealing money from the apostolic purse. And our blessed Lord would not let him escape with that challenge, and he said to Judas, Judas, the poor you have always with you. Me, you have not always. If you are so anxious about serving the poor, there are never occasions that are wanting. But I am with you only for a short time. In other words, he was telling Judas, as happens in our world today, you seemingly are very interested in social justice. Why are you not concerned about individual justice? You love neighbor? Why do you not love God? This is the attitude of the world today. You see, we have swung from a period in religion where we were concerned with individual sanctification to the neglect of the social order. Now we've gone to the extreme of being immersed with social justice, civil rights, and so forth, but are not the least bit concerned about individual justice and the duty of paying honor and glory to God. If you march with a banner, if you protest, then your individual life may be impure and alcoholic, anything you please. That does not matter. Judas is the patron saint of those who divide that universal law of God. Love God and love neighbor. And then turning to the woman. He said, look at her. In other words, you see only a tag. Maybe you think of her as a sinner. She has done this for my burial. We do not know if Mary really understood those words. But can you imagine the impact that would be made at a banquet when the guest of honor, when he's presented with a gift, said, this is for my burial. She was honoring the empty tomb of Lazarus, and now the Lord himself speaks of his own empty tomb. Did she see that he was on his way to his death? We cannot be sure of that. And it is not likely because she brought spices to anoint him on Easter Sunday morning. But certainly that woman's intuition saw something that none of the other guests did. 
And then our Lord said to her, What this woman has done will be told all around the world, even to the end of time. That little incident in an insignificant village to those who would consider the Lord insignificant was prophesied as resounding about the universe and here in New York City on this Good Friday as the Lord foretold the story is told. One man hurriedly gets up from the table, goes out the door. It was Judas. It was not that he just could not take that reprimand. It rather he was bent on other business. He goes to the Sanhedrin, to the chief council of the city, and he says to the Sanhedrin, what will you give me? Everything wrong begins with give me. The prodigal, when he left home, said, give me. What will you give me? And I will deliver him over unto you. They talked among themselves. And they fixed the fee at the price of a slave. What was our Lord worth? About 30 pieces of silver. Slave he was. The Greek word for slave is doulos. It is used over 40 times in the New Testament. Slave does two things. He does hard things and he does dirty things. Even to bearing the burden of human sin. So the price is fixed. And they gather together thirty pieces of silver and they drop them one by one on that hand that was blessed by the Lord when he was called to be an apostle. And Judas went out with his thirty pieces of silver. Remember, all who are listening to me, you can sell the Lord, but you can never buy him. And he's always sold out of all proportion to his due worth. And we get sick of what we get. As Judas was and brought back his money and flung it into their faces, jingling on the floor, saying, I have betrayed innocent blood. Think on your lives. How many times have you sold? 